So, atomic emission spectroscopy was all well and good. You know, it was very useful and very effective for for looking at different types of substances. However, there was this recurring with there was this recurring problem with uh, with atomic emission spectroscopy. It was very difficult to heat some elements in a flame enough for them to get excited and then emit light. And so this was a recurring issue that made atomic emission spectroscopy uh, sort of a bit difficult to use and, and not quite, you know, not, not that versatile, not appropriate for all the elements that that everybody wanted to analyze. So what happened, this guy, this guy named Alan Walsh, an Australian scientist, decided that rather than using heat to excite the to excite uh, our metal, as in atomic emission spectroscopy, we could uh, use. He had the brainwave to use light rather than heat to excite an atom. Now we know that an atom can be excited by by heat or light, and if it's going to be excited by light, it can only be excited by uh, the photon of light that has exactly the right amount of energy. To uh, to excite uh, the electrons exactly to the next shell. So a photon, for example, if we have an electron in this shell here, then a photon of light can be absorbed if that photon carries energy exactly equivalent to the difference in energy between the first shell and the second shell here. If uh, if such a photon is absorbed, then this electron will move out to the second shell. And so only very specific uh, frequencies of light can be used to excite an atom. So basically, rather than measuring the frequencies of light that are going to be released by an atom as it's de-excited, we can analyze the frequencies of light that are absorbed by an atom as it gets excited. And so obviously, these frequencies are going to be the same. If an atom is excited from the, uh, from the first shell to the second shell, it's going to absorb exactly the difference in energy between the two shells. And as it are uh, as it returns back to the first shell, it's going to release that same uh, amount of energy. And so if we're absorbing and emitting light, then the light that we're absorbing and emitting is going to be the same. So that this uh, paved the way for atomic absorption spectroscopy, which uses light to excite atoms. So what we have here is we have, our, uh, we have a lamp. Now this lamp is sort of made of the metal that we're trying to analyze. So if we've, uh, if we've got a sample of sodium, or if we've got a sample of metal and we want to see if it's sodium, then we're going to use a sodium lamp. And what that means is that uh, the sodium lamp is going to release frequencies of light that are going to, that are emitted by sodium atoms as they are de-excited. And so those are going to be the frequencies of light that are going to be absorbed if, uh, if sodium is in our sample. So what we do is we get a lamp, is we get a, a lamp that is made of the same metal that we're trying to, or the same metal of interest. And then what we do is we, is we spray our sample, the sample that we're testing, into the flame here. We make a solution of it and we spray it into the flame. So what happens then is, uh, is the sample gets vaporized. So we've got light coming from our lamp and then it passes through this vaporized, uh, this vaporized uh, metal in this flame. And so what happens is we know that certain frequencies of light from this lamp uh, are likely to be absorbed by the, the vaporized atoms at, uh, so that the atoms can be excited. And so what's going to happen is that certain frequencies of the light coming out of this lamp may be absorbed by the vaporized metal. So what that means is that a different, slightly different shade of light or different, not all the frequencies of light are going to leave the flame. So what we can do is we then we then measure or sort of analyze the light leaving the flame, leaving the atomic vapor. And so we do that by means of a monochromator. So this is what we call a monochromator, this piece of equipment here. So what a monochromator does is basically it takes advantage of the fact that different frequencies of light will diffract by different amounts as we go through a prism here. So if we go through a prism here, and um, say so we're, we're dealing with some red light, and some blue light. Well, firstly, the prism is going to break up the red and the blue light, and then we can move this uh, this slit around such that we only are we only measuring the amount of a certain color 
of light. So for example, in this position, the slit has been moved around such that uh, it's only letting purple light through it because it knows how much the purple light is going to diffract. So here, if we're only letting purple light through, we can measure how much purple light is making its way through. And so by moving this around, we can see how much of each wave of each frequency or color of light is making it through the atomic vapor. And so obviously, because some frequencies of light are going to be absorbed by uh, by the by the atom, we're going to have some some frequencies of light that are where not much of that light is making it through to the detector. So whereas we had the while we had the atomic emission spectrum before that had different lines of light on it. The atomic absorption spectrum looks a little bit different. So if we've got a full spectrum of, of light here, just a rough a rough picture of our of our full spectrum of light. So we've got these colours roughly in this order, or well in this order, but there's obviously going to be some more more in, more intermediate colours. So if we've got our spectrum, that, that's our full spectrum of visible light here. So if we've got obviously before we know that we had our emission spectrum looks something like this, you know, if, if a bit of yellow light was emitted, we'd have a yellow line there, maybe some green line was a green light was emitted, like that. Well, if we have an absorption spectrum, then we know that pretty much all of the light is going to make it through this flame, and so it's all, going to, it's all going to be coming through and it's going to be reaching the detector. However, if we were to have the same element in a, in atomic absorption spectroscopy, then it would be the yellow light and the green light that would be absorbed, and thus there would be less or no yellow and green light reaching the detector because the yellow and the green light was being absorbed by the atoms in the flame as they were being excited. So what we end up with is we end up with a full spectrum of light with some black lines, some a couple of little gaps. So basically these gaps represent the points where uh, this, these certain frequencies of light are these gaps where these lines are were the frequencies of light that were absorbed by the vaporized metal. And thus, uh, very little of that light is reaching the detector. So that's how we can sort of, we can, again, we can analyze atoms and identify atoms based on the frequencies of light that they absorb, rather than the frequencies of light that they emit, as was the case in atomic emission spectroscopy. So these are the differences between our two spectrums. So we've got a, an absorption spectrum here. And down here, this is our emission spectrum. And so it just so happens that the amount of light that is going to get absorbed uh, by this flame here, by the metal in this flame, the amount of a certain frequency of light that will be absorbed uh, is related to the quantity of the metal that we have in our metal solution. So if we're vaporizing a metal solution and it's a very strong metal solution, then pretty much all of these are uh, this yellow frequency and this green frequency of light will be absorbed. But if there's not that much metal in the solution, then you know not all of the yellow and green light will be absorbed. And so we're going to analyze, we're going to go through how we can sort of qualitatively analyze our absorption spectrum uh, a little bit later on. But for now, this is generally what an absorption spectrum looks like. We're going to go through that in another video, though. And so now, if we wanted to look at a bit of an example just to help us understand even further atomic absorption spectroscopy versus emission spectroscopy, then let's say that I've got a sample of potassium. Let's say I'm testing some potassium and I, I've run I've run it through both an atomic uh, I've, I've, I've obtained both an atomic absorption spectrum which will say this is just hypothetically uh, we will say it looks a little something like this we'll just draw up our full spectrum of visible light here so this is just rough obviously these colors are going to blend in very nicely on our actual spectrum So this is the uh, the atomic absorption spectrum. And so we'll say that, so this is our full, light, full spectrum of light. We'll say that there's a gap here, a gap here, or two gaps here, and another one up here. So that is the absorption spectrum. Now I do the same thing and I create, I obtain 
um, emission spectrum. Now I'm just making these up. These are absorption and emission spectrums up. However, uh, so the potassium spectrum may actually look different to this. I'm just doing a hypothetical situation. So here we've got the emission spectrum looking a little bit like this. So we've got, obviously, all the lines should be the same because the, the amount of energy that's required to excite an atom and the amount of energy that is released as, that, as an electron in that atom returns back to the ground state is the same. However, in my emission spectrum, I've got a couple of extra lines. I've got a line here, and I've got two lines here. So, if we look at the structure of the atom, so we want to work out why, why has this happened? Surely these two spectrums should look the same. Because in either case, we're in one case we're dealing with an electron going from here to here. In another case, we're dealing with electrons going from here to here. And in both cases, the change in energy is the same. So we should have the same colors of light, shouldn't we? Well, why are they different? That's what we want to... That is what we want to work out. Why are they different? Well, basically, in the absorption spectrum, we're dealing with the, the excitation of an atom. So, presuming if we start with all our atoms in their ground state, so ignore these two here, if we ignore these, those two there. So we're starting off with all our electrons in the innermost shell that they can be. So I've got uh, eight electrons in that second shell and two in the first shell. When when the absorption spectrum is created, we're dealing with the excitation of electrons. And so if if we have an electron that, say, is excited, we'll just draw part of the fourth and fifth shells here. So if we have an electron, say, from the second shell that is excited out to the fifth shell, it's going to absorb a frequency of light uh, equal to the, that carries the energy that is equal to the difference between the fifth shell and the second shell. And when, is it, when an atom is excited, the electron is going to go straight all the way to the fifth shell. Now, when that same electron is de-excited, as it's coming back down to the ground state, it can do so via a number of different paths. It could go like this. It could go back to the fourth shell and then back to the second shell. Or it could go back to the, back to the third shell and then back to the second shell. Or it could go, it could go all the way in one hit. Or maybe it'll go shell by shell, so it'll go to the fourth shell, then the third shell, then the second shell. So basically what we're seeing here is that when an electron is excited, it's going to go straight to the shell that it is excited to. However, as it is de-excited, it could go via any number of pathways. It could go straight back down, in which case it will produce the same frequency of light that helped the electron get excited and move out to the fifth shell because the difference in energy levels between the fifth and second shells is the same whether the electron's going up or down. However, if the electron goes straight up and then moves down first to the fourth shell and then back down to the second shell, then as it is de-excited, it's going to release two photons. It's going to release one containing the energy difference between the fifth shell and the fourth shell, and then another containing the energy difference between the fourth shell and the the second shell. So it's going to release two photons on its way down, and both of those photons are going to be different to the photon that it absorbed, This representing this red line here, this red arrow. And so as we see, there's lots more paths for an electron to go via as it is de-excited. When it's excited, it goes via one path straight to its final destination. However, when it's de-excited, it can go through many intermediate shells. And for that reason, we have more colors of light that can be released in an emission spectrum. An emission spectrum uh, contains all the photons of light released by all these uh, different journeys that the electron can go on its way down. And so there are more different colors that come out when, a, uh, when an atom is becoming de-excited. So when it's excited, uh, it can absorb a certain number of different colors of light. However, when an atom is de-excited, it's going to release more. So the atomic emission spectrum will always contain more lines than the atomic absorption spectrum for that reason. So that's, that explains the difference between our two spectrums for potassium. So we're gonna, we, now we understand how atomic absorption spectroscopy works and sort of some slight differences between it and emission spectros spectroscopy. 
and we're going to go through in another video how we can further use an absorption spectrum to analyze a substance in even more detail.